This is passage one, which uh, generally starts out as literature, so we're told in the blurb, the passage is adapted from this book. After a long journey from her home in England, eight-year-old Jessamy is meeting her mother's family in Nigeria for the first time. So basically the first paragraph opens up with this tone of uncertainty as it's describing how the family is standing there, and we get introduced to her grandfather, and it appears that she has sort of an intimidating picture of him, as it says here that um, she had this sudden irrational fear that he might start shouting at her. What does he do? He looks at her in the next paragraph, mock consternation, kind of joking. Her father is basically encouraging her um, in this encounter. His grandfather holds out a hand and she basically starts thinking about what they look like. She, of course, is still nervous because this is her first time encountering her, and also because in the next line it says she did not know what was expected of her. The next thing that happens is he calls her by her name, and her reaction is kind of interesting. It says she froze, and she knew that Warola was her name, and she knew that her grandfather had apparently asked her to be named that in her naming ceremony, and she also knows the meaning of the name. But why was she startled? It says here that nobody had ever called her Waroa, not even her mother. And that makes sense because, you know, she grew up in England and this is her first time back to Nigeria. And the next paragraph is just talking about how she's um, in this new setting. She's still reflecting on her name. She says, Waroa sounded like another person, not her at all. And so she begins to ask herself some questions. This is like her internal dialogue. Should she answer to this name? Should she become someone else? Should she become Waroa and how? Moving to the next paragraph, this is actually her first response to her grandfather. She says, hello, grandfather. And then after that, what you'll notice is that there's this kind of long period in between line 46 and 47. After they had taken baths, basically her mother disappeared with her aunt. Her father started to talk to her uncle, and then her father actually released her back into her grandfather's clutches, and so their encounter is going to continue. So from line 56 and on, she actually starts to look at her grandfather a little bit more closely, he talks about his face. Here she continues to reflect on his appearance. You know, the overall sense that you guess from this paragraph is that he's actually a little bit less intimidating than she originally thought. He was quite short, moved about very quickly. She herself is still kind of very timid. It says she keep, is keeping very still so she wouldn't take up much space. So starting in line 68 when it says that she felt as if there were a little piece of him that had crumbled off, starting to talk about their connection as family members. In the last paragraph, they're still sitting together. They're waiting for something. The last few lines are interesting. Um, it says, really, Jessamy sensed that they were waiting to see if they would like each other or not. Question one. In using the phrase uncertain circle in line one, the narrator most nearly means that the family members are. So let's take a look at that phrase. There they all stood in an uncertain circle, and then her grandfather came forward, greeted her mother, shook hands with her father. So what's the reason for the uncertain circle? You know, one thing is that this is the first time for them going back to Nigeria. Two, it seems like they're all kind of focused on this interaction um, between her and her grandfather. So let's go through the answer choices. Choice A, disoriented after an unusually difficult journey. Well, it does say that there was a long journey in the blurb up here, but there's really no evidence that they were either disoriented or that the journey itself was difficult. So I'd say these two words make choice A wrong. B, self-conscious and tentative about interacting. B does seem like a good choice from everything that we said. Keep in mind that, you know, remember her father was there um, encouraging her and she was thinking about everything that was going on. Choice C, openly suspicious of uh, each other's motives. So for choice C to work, you would have to find some evidence in the passage that they did not trust each other, number one, and that they were openly suspicious. In other words, did they say something to each other? Did they give each other dirty looks? There's really nothing in there that would indicate that. Choice D, dependent on one another for reassurance. Again, choice D, you don't really find any evidence for. They would have to be looking back at each other, maybe nodding to each other, smiling, giving each other reassurance about this interaction. Really, the only interaction that you see, again, is that her father did look at her and smiled at her, basically to encourage her. 
but there's no indication that she really like needed that or that other family members were looking at each other for that kind of reassurance. So the best choice does seem to be B. So questions two and three should be done together, but let's look through the answer choices in two very briefly. Based on the passage, which factor most decisively influences Jess's reaction to meeting her grandfather? Choice A, his intimidating physical presence and mannerisms. Uh, we'll keep this as a possibility because there were certain things about his um, appearance that you could interpret as intimidating. B, his indifference to other family members' attitudes. There really was no indication that he did not care about what other family members thought about him. What was going on inside his heads and other family members was really just not the focus. So not likely B. Choice C, her parents' concerns about being reunited with him. Again, maybe you can argue that her parents were concerned about her being reunited, but did that influence her reaction? Probably not. Choice D, her mother's ominous descriptions of his temperament. There was something in the first paragraph that talked about that, so we'll keep an eye on that for now. Question three, which choice provides the best evidence for the answer to the previous question? So you basically just have to go through each of them. Choice A, lines one to three. Now keep in mind you're looking for something that'll give evidence that whatever that thing was, it influenced her reaction to meeting her grandfather. So lines one to three, there they all stood in an uncertain circle and her grandfather came forward, greeted her mother, shook her hands. Again, nothing here about her own reaction, nothing here that might influence her reaction. So choice A is out. Choice B, lines three to seven. Although he seemed mellower and smaller than the picture that her mother had painted for her over the years, Jess had a sudden and irrational fear that he might start shouting at her. So this actually does seem to work going along with choice D, her mother's ominous descriptions of his temperament, because it basically says that he looked mellower and smaller than what her mother had said. So that suggests that her mother painted him as maybe like someone who's very irritable or not very friendly, big, intimidating, and that accounts for the irrational fear that she started having of him. So choice B does seem like it'll work. Choice C, lines eight through 10. He looked at her, put his hands on, her, on his hips in mock consternation, and her cousins and her mother laughed. So, I mean, you could argue that here his mannerisms kind of intimidated her when he put his hands on his hips, but it doesn't seem like that's the most decisive factor or the reason why she might have a certain impression of him. B still seems stronger. Lines 12 through 15, let's read it. Her grandfather held out a hand. His hands were big and square, spade-like, the palms deeply etched and calloused. She took a step towards him. So here, I don't know, on the one hand, he held out his hand, which is kind of a friendly gesture. On the other hand, maybe the appearance of his hands because he's older, it seemed like he worked a lot of his life, perhaps that intimidated her. But again, like choice C, I don't think that's the most decisive influence in her reaction. Question four, in the passage, the actions of Jess's father suggest that he, all right, let's go back to the passage and look at the two times it mentions her father. One is in line 10. Her father, standing slightly on the outside of the circle, smiled encouragingly at her. And then the second place it mentions her father was right before her second interaction, where it says her father befriended Uncle Kunle, who was clearly as newspaper, newspaper minded as he was and wanted to talk about politics. And then her father released her into her grandfather's clutches again. So let's consider the answer choices. A, is less sociable than are the other members of the family? Probably not because he did end up speaking to her uncle. Choice B, has an imperfect understanding of Nigerian culture. You might be able to under argue this implicitly because it says he was standing slightly outside the circle. Is that symbolic? I don't know, but it's not clear enough evidence for the SAT. Choice C, advocates for just to choose her own name. Again, no indication of that whatsoever. Really the choice that Jess has about which name she's gonna go with is her own. And in the naming ceremony, it was only her grandfather. Choice D, wishes to promote Jess's introduction to her grandfather. That seems to work because the first time it says he, he smiled encouragingly at her as, he, as she first met him. The second time he released her into her grandfather's clutches. So both those um, lines uh, justify choice D, which is the answer. Question five, based on lines 21 to 32, which choice best describes Jess's initial reaction to being addressed as Warola? So back at the passage, 21, he calls her Warola. She says, who? She froze. 
not knowing what to say or do. Of course, she knew that it was her name, the name that her grandfather had asked her to be called. It also says Warula means gold. She knew all this, but nobody had ever called her Warula, not even her mother. So we're really looking for something that conveys a sense of unfamiliarity or the fact that she knew it in her head, but she didn't really feel it emotionally, that it was um, strange and new to her. Choice A, she resents that her Nigerian family insists on using that name. Again, I mean, there's no evidence of resentment. It's more like lack of familiarity. And the fact that he called her by that name once doesn't mean that they're insisting on using the name. So A is out. B, she recognizes the name. That's true but cannot recall its precise meaning in Yoruba. That's actually not true because it says it means gold and then she knew all this, implying that she also knew its exact meaning. So B is out. Choice C, she startled that her grandfather has remembered the name. Again, startled possibly, but is it because her grandfather has remembered the name? It's Again, it's more because she's not familiar with the name, not that she was expecting him to forget the name. Choice D, she is aware that it is her name, but is unable to acknowledge it as such. So this is really going to be the closest to the answer. To me, if I were writing this question, I would say she's aware that it is her name, but she's unable to kind of reconcile it with her on an emotional level. D is close enough, so that's the answer. Question six, which choice best supports the idea that Jess is familiar with some of the customs that her mother's family observes? So basically, we just have to go through each one. Choice A, lines 23 to 26. Of course, she knew that Waroa was her Yoruba name, the name that her grandfather had asked in a letter for her to be called when her mother had held her Nigerian naming ceremony. So this does seem like it'll work because she's aware of the naming ceremony. So we'll hold on to that one. Choice B, lines 29 to 32. But nobody had ever called her Waroa, even her mother, whom she could now see from the corner of her eye making anxious, silent gestures for her to go to her grandfather. So again, uh, really no mention of customs here. So B is out. Choice C, 42 to 46. She could not make herself move forward, so she stayed where she was, avoided his touch, looked up into her grandfather's face, smiled and said quietly but firmly in her most polite voice, hello, grandfather. Again, here, no mention of customs, no mention of her awareness of customs, so that's out. 59 through 63. He had the same wide, strong jawline with the dirt determined set as her mother and the same prominent cheekbones, although Jess could see that they were made angular more through the emaciation of age uh, than anything else. So again, this is talking about him aging, him being connected with his mother. Again, it doesn't really show that she has knowledge of any customs because none are mentioned. So that really leaves choice A and that's the answer. Question seven, the main purpose of the description in lines 33 to 37 is to, so let's look at 33 to 37. Here in this stone-walled corridor where the sunlight came in through the enormous stiff mosquito screens over every window and her clothes hung to her like another skin, Warola sounded like another person, not her at all. So again, this is her right after her grandfather called her this. Um, she's thinking about um, the fact that it doesn't sound like her. Why are they talking about the setting? I think you really get a sense of, again, unfamiliarity different environment, and particularly here where her clothes clung to her like another skin, meaning to say it doesn't feel like her own, her name doesn't feel like her own at all. Choice A, underscore Jess's philosophical musings by invoking a natural setting. So again, not really philosophical musings, more musings about her identity and her name. Natural setting, probably not either because she's inside and they're just talking about like mosquito nets and um, the fact that it's very hot. So again, on a lot of these answer choices, a few words can make the whole choice wrong. That's the case here in A. So just the correspondence between Jess's physical surrounding and her emotional state. I think this one seems to work because like we said, the sense is that she's in an unfamiliar place. Her emotional state is that she doesn't feel like herself. She's in another skin, sounds like another person. So we'll keep B. Choice C, portray Jess's thoughts about her Nigerian background through a nostalgic lens. Again, nostalgia has a sense of thinking about the past or going back in time. Nothing like that going on here. Choice D, reveal Jess's acceptance of her new life by depicting a common occurrence. There's really no indication that she's going to be forced to stay here or um, she's going to be forced to take up a new life. Most likely they're going to go back to England. So not that. 
and common occurrence. I don't know what they would be referring to as a common occurrence, being in that room, mosquito nets, not really sure. Doesn't seem to be right, so choice B is the answer. Number eight, the series of questions in lines 38 to 41 serves primarily to portray Jess's what? So the questions are, should she answer to this name and by doing so steal the identity of someone who belonged here? Should she become Waraloa? But how? So all these questions are really asking what should she do with this new information? The fact that she has this name but it doesn't really kind of match with her identity as she was growing up. So looking at choice A, confusion over her grandfather's attachment to his culture. So there's really no indication that her name is an indication that her grandfather is attached to his culture. It seems like this was just the natural thing to do, give her that name in the naming ceremony, and there's no conflict between her and her grandfather. Choice B, lack of familiarity with common Nigerian names. No, because she's not saying like, I've never heard of this name, what kind of name is this? She's more asking the question of who is she in relation to this name? C, concern about constructing a new sense of who she is. This kind of makes sense because, you know, think about it, she grew up in England and now she's being confronted with this Nigerian name and she's asking questions like, um, should she become Waroa? How? Should she steal the identity of someone who belonged here? Choice D, uncertainty about the roles of other family members. Again, this is between her and her name, so there's really no mention of other family members. Number nine, Jess's second encounter with her grandfather differs from her first encounter because in the second encounter, Jess, all right, so let's look at the second encounter very briefly. It basically starts um, in line like 52, 53, where it says, her father released her into her grandfather's clutches before mounting the stairs. And what happens? Starting in the next paragraph, she started to notice her grandfather. So it says her grandfather did have a face because now she's looking at it directly. The thing that she noticed is right here, the emaciation of age more than anything else. So if anything, this suggests that she's less intimidated by him now than she was before. The next paragraph, she talks about possible connections between her and him. She felt as if she were a little piece of him that had crumbled off. Again, their connection because they're family. And she's also basically continuing to stare at him openly and seriously. Choice A, must face her grandfather without support from other members of her family. That does seem to be right because if you remember, it says in line 48, her mother disappeared with her younger sister. Her father befriended Uncle Kunli. And then um, that's when she was kind of uh, thrown in with her grandfather. So choice A seems like a possibility. Choice B, more clearly startled by her grandfather's unpredictable behavior. If anything, I would say that there really isn't anything going on. Her grandfather's not behaving in any particular way. If anything, it seems to be that she's less intimidated. Now she has the time to really take a look at him and, and figure out what she thinks. Choice C has become more confident of her grandfather's ultimate approval. Again, because there's really no exchange for them besides staring at each other, you really can't um, conclude that. And also in line 72, it does say it was impossible to tell what he thought of her. So choice C doesn't work, and choice D has a little time to become acquainted with her grandfather before speaking to him. I would say that's actually the opposite because they're spending all this time just looking at each other, they're waiting for these drinks, and it, it is a moment where they're kind of both taking the time to contemplate their relationship. So choice A is the answer. Number 10, as used in line 76, crisp most nearly means so for these types of questions, you want to look at the sentence, cross out the original word, and replace it with your own. That kind of makes sense. He sat very upright, his hands on his knees, the blank lines of his white shirt almost molding him, fixing him still in her sight. So what would it mean for lines on a shirt to be crisp? We're obviously talking about folds in this shirt. So imagine that your shirt was ironed so what would those lines look like they're probably very well defined they'd probably be very precise they'd probably be very sharp they would probably be easy to notice so if we look through the answer choices sharp is one of the choices and that's the one that works abrupt means like rather quickly that something happens Fragile means easily breakable, it doesn't make any sense. Refreshing has a sense of something new, um, cool, but sharp is most likely what we mean to describe folds in a shirt. 
Hey everyone, if you liked that video, please hit like and subscribe. More importantly, if you want to see me go through the whole March 2020 SAT, then click below for access to my Udemy course. I go through every question in the reading, writing, and math sections. I specifically made it for students who don't have access to high quality tutors or after school programs. So I hope you guys enjoy.